basic uh, home loan weed control, uh, understanding of weeds, uh, kind of some of their, the nomenclature, some of the morphology of weeds and some of the, just the descriptions and how you can identify the types of weeds uh, that may be giving you some issues in your loans, um, kind of the timing of some things and just some, some ways of identifying basically. So when we're talking about weeds, the first thing we really need to do is figure out what is considered a weed. Uh, basically a weed is anything, any plant that is growing out of place. So that can be a corn stalk growing in the middle of a soybean field. That can be Bermuda grass creeping into, from your yard into your flower bed. So not all weeds are necessarily bad plants. They're just not in the right location. Um, so just kind of something to think about there. Um, so what are some of the issues that weeds give us is basically the biggest one or the biggest couple uh, basically irregular growth compared to our normal turf grass in a home lawn instance. Obviously that's going to be a little different than in a uh, like a garden variety or or garden setting or a uh, flower bed setting because um, you know we're a little bit different beast there we're working with but so this can lead to a little bit more frequent mowing just because our weeds may be outgrowing our our long turf grass, so it gives it kind of an irregular look and just kind of a kind of not that clean, well manicured look that a lot of people like to see in their lawn. Uh, I'm kind of under the impression of if it's green, it's good, as I've mentioned earlier with Christian. So, um, you know, weeds don't bother me too much uh, unless it just gets way out of hand. He mentioned one earlier that is a pretty bad one, the Bahia grass, which is used for a lot of great things. It's a great grass for forage production. It's just in a St. Augustine lawn, it grows a lot faster and throws up that nasty seed head, which typically requires Christian mow his grass a little more often if he wants that um, uniform look and, you know, just that kind of that well manicured look. So, and also weeds can absorb nutrients and water that we put out there for our turf grass, obviously hurting the ability of the turf grass to absorb those nutrients because they're being taken up by by a competitor so there's basically just a competition um circumstance there where um you know we're, we're putting out we're paying money for fertilizer and water where we want it to be taken up by our turf grass and unfortunately it's being used uh by an unwanted um nuisance like a like a weed or whether it be a dandelion or whatever weed it may be. Um, now weeds can be considered beneficial by some people. So a lot of them can be edible. Uh, a lot of them may be, may have a nice attractive flower on them that attract pollinators and insects and things like that, that, that are beneficial in other areas of our landscape, whether it be our vegetable garden or whether it be our flower garden. So honeybees, those sorts of things, obviously, uh, are attracted to dandelions and that is a good nectar source for them uh, early in the spring. So again, not all weeds are bad necessarily. They just uh, kind of take the track away from what a lot of people would be, would consider in a, you know, a well manicured, a well, well managed lawn. You want to kind of want that uniformity. So when we're talking about weeds, we kind of need to know there's three separate things we really need to do. We need to identify the type of weed. We need to identify the life cycle of the weed. And then we also need to identify the seasonal emergence of the weed, particular weed we're, we're, we're dealing with. So the, we're gonna break these each, each, three, each of these three down and do basically two to three subsections and we're gonna look at each one of those. So on the identification part, um, the first one is grasses. Um, obviously, on, we have grasses, broadleaves, and sedges under the identification. Uh, the first one would be grasses. Typically, grasses have parallel veins or always have parallel veins within the leaf. So, uh, if you look at the leaf and you have that one midrib, uh, typically a lot easier to point out. And then alongside that, you're going to have parallel veins running down the length of that grass blade, leaf blade. So 
stems are typically hollow um, and round. You can see on that picture on the bottom left, the bamboo. Uh, a lot of people don't imagine it, but bamboo is a grass. So that is a very easy way to depict basically the hollow round stems of a grass. Uh, you'll see the brown areas, the basically the internode or the nodes where the leaves come out of the root. Those are internodes and then the areas, or those are the nodes and then the green spots are the internodes. So that is one, those are two characteristics of grasses that are always there. You always have a node, you can see it on the Bermuda grass here. Uh, in the middle picture, you can see where the leaves are attached and then in between those leaves um, are the internodes of the, of the stem. So um, grasses typically have inconspicuous flowers. They're not like a, um, Coreopsis or a, you know, a real pretty showy flower like a lot of our broad leaves or a lot of our other um, types of plants are. Uh, you can see the centipede seed head up here in the top right hand corner. It's just basically a little small stalk that has some pollen and um, some seed, a seed attached to it. So it's very inconspicuous. It's not something that just shows itself off. Uh, can't be seen from a long distance typically, so it's not really attracting pollinators per se. Um, so it's not really going to be one of those that is very attractive to flock to bees and that sort of thing. A lot of our um, what we consider to be beneficial but pollinators. Grasses can typically be an annual or a perennial, so we don't see a lot of the biennial grasses. So a lot of our, obviously a lot of our home lawn species are hopefully perennials. Hopefully we're not out there replanting our lawn every year. Um, it can be done, I guess. Uh, a lot of our ryegrasses and things like that um, can be considered an annual um, in forage production and things like that for overseeding lawns. But, um, but typically they are considered a perennial. Uh, and Along that line, the annual or perennial, uh, a lot of this is going to be determined by where you are. So in some places, an annual, uh, like here on the kind of close to the Mississippi Gulf Coast, um, a lot of our turf grasses are perennials and a lot of plants are perennials because of the conditions, our climatic conditions here. Uh, you go further north, um, you know, up in Ohio, a lot of plants that may be perennials here may die back each winter in the cold with the cold weather and be considered an annual in somewhere else and vice versa. Somewhere that a cold weather plant here may be considered an annual and somewhere else where it's more in its right climatic conditions may be considered a perennial. So, um, you know, that's, that can be kind of taken with a grain of salt there. Um, but most of the time our grasses are perennials. So the next type of identification is broad leaves. Uh, this is just what it sounds like. They typically have broad leaves. Uh, they don't have the parallel leaf veination structure like grasses do. They have a branched veination pattern. You can see that in this uh, dollar weed picture down here on the, in the center on the bottom. It kind of demonstrates that branched pattern very well. Um, Stems are typically round again, um, just like grasses. Grasses are typically hollow, broadleaf, not so much, but they can be, not saying that they're not, but, uh, and they have a little bit more showy flower. Uh, as you can see on that Virginia buttonweed over there on the right, uh, that little white flower, it may not be big and what we consider to, you know, it's not a plant that you're gonna wanna have in your flower bed just for, to show off its flowers, but, um, it will have a more showy flower that is a little more um, attractive to pollinators and things like that than grasses. So, and under broad leaves, they can either be an annual, a biennial, or a perennial. So an annual, obviously, um, one year life cycle, biennial two, and a perennial uh, multiple years. Uh, chamber bitter, you can see here, the one on the bottom left, uh, with the seeds underneath the stem of the leaves there. Uh, it can be a big issue uh, with a lot of homeowners, um, especially with um, considering 
you can see the amount of seed production they have there. The next one would be sedges. This is kind of a grass-like plant. Uh, it is not a grass. It is a monocot like a grass. So it has the uh, single leaf uh, cotyledon leaves. So when it emerges, it only has one leaf that emerges out of, from the seed where broad leaves typically have or always have two. Um, they are dicots. So um, they will have a two cotyledon leaves when they emerge. Sedges have triangular stems, which you can very clearly see on that cross section of the stem up there in the top right hand corner. Uh, you can take that stem and roll it in your fingers and you can definitely feel those, those edges on those stems. That is one of the easiest ways to identify a sedge. Um, a lot of these sedges grow in kind of a, typically grow in moist environments, whether it be uh, kind of a low lying area that doesn't have the best of drainage. Um, now it's not always the case, but that's where they like to, like to grow for the most part. Uh, a lot of these sedges and rushes you will see find along pond banks and pond um, dams and things like that along the pond, edges of, the pond, of a pond. So, Sedges are typically considered a perennial. Um, they're not necessarily a perennial, but they do have these nuts or tubers that allow the plant to reemerge each year. So they kind of act like both for the most part, kind of act like a little bit of an annual or a perennial, but they're usually, con they're treated like a perennial as far as control goes. So you can see here on this yellow nut sedge on the bottom right, where it's kind of got the goldish seed heads. Um, it does have a little, little bit showier flower than a grass typically does. So um, it's not necessarily, again, not something that you're wanting to plant for, um, to put out there for aesthetic reasons, but um, some, another way to identify it. They, they're usually a little more spiked uh, seeds. Uh, you can see the maybe a kylinga down there on the bottom left with the little or the globe sedge down there on the bottom left um that's just kind of got little spikes on the ends of the seed seed heads um and these are typically controlled with a post-emergent herbicide they're not really pre-emergents are not really effective on these um so just go know that going into it and typically a lot of times you're gonna you know try to change maybe some drainage issues or uh, I've heard a lot of people say and I've been told many a times where if you're trying to control these the easiest thing to do is just move um, unfortunately or rent out some hogs and have them go through and till up and root out all the nuts and the tubers out of the soil and that's going to be about the about the best control you can you can hope for uh, with this plant um, now, again, there, we do have a few options. That's kind of being a little, little facetious, but uh, they are tough to control because you can, they will are very, very prolific uh, producers of these nuts or tubers that are in the soil and they're they are very, very active for quite a long time. So they can remain viable. So next we're gonna move into the various life cycles. Uh, so we've talked about grasses, we've talked about uh, broad leaves and we've talked about sedges. Now we're going to move into the uh, life cycle of different weeds. Uh, the first one is going to be an annual. These complete their life cycle in one year. Uh, so that means they germinate from a seed, they grow, and they produce a seed all within one life cycle or all within one growing season. So they, the plants that we're seeing now germinate, they, the annuals that we see germinate right now uh, will produce a seed later this summer, early this fall, and then they will die. Uh, and then next year they will, again, complete that same life cycle. So all root stems and leaves of the plant die back annually, unlike a perennial where they typically the roots survive over the course of the winter or the summer, depending on if it's a warm season or cool season. We'll look at that as well. Um, and then they, they, re, they come back from their roots. But um, these come back from seed each year. So these are basically, reseed, they reseed themselves. Um, and a lot of times since they do reseed themselves, uh, they can be controlled with 
with either pre or post emergent herbicides. Uh, so we do have a little bit more options with a lot of these annuals than we do with the perennial plant as far as weed control goes, as far as herbicide or chemical control. Um, obviously we could, you could do a little bit of manual or a little bit of, um, you know, mechanical removal. Um, that's always a great thing to do before, uh, before it goes to seed, any type of hand, hand pulling or, you know, using a hoe out in the garden to remove plants or even in your yard or flower bed. Um, mechanical removal is a, is a very effective method of weed control. So a couple of annuals that we see a lot uh, in our home lawn are pictured on this slide. Uh, the bottom one in the center um, is crabgrass. That one is basically probably emerging now or a couple, within the past few weeks it has emerged. Uh, it may not be quite to that stage just yet except for maybe in some container beds or something where container gardens where uh, where the soil is a little bit warmer but typically we see crabgrass emerge when the soil is about 55 to 60 degrees for a few days so you know with the cooler temperatures we've been having we it took us a little bit longer to reach that this year um, than we normally do but typically that's when we see crabgrass emerge the one on the far right there with the white little looking seed heads that is poana uh, or annual bluegrass and that is a cool season annual so it germinates in late summer early fall and it grows throughout the winter and sets seed in the spring and then it dies in the heat and um, heat of the spring so that's a that's a big big one i get um over the course of the winter people wondering what's this what is this weed growing in my yard it's nice and green and um, you know, it's got a little, it's kind of a limey green color, um, yellowish green, and it produces, it is a prolific seed producer, uh, and it can produce seed very quickly and very easily, even no matter how, how close you, you mow it, it can still somehow produce a seed head. This is a big problem on golf courses as well. Um, it can handle very, very low heights of cut, um, even down on basically to a green to a green mowing of, you know, point, 0.15 inch or 0.18 inch, somewhere around in there, it can, it can produce a seed head at uh, basically, you know, a fifth of an inch. So uh, it's pretty tough to, pretty tough to control, but pre-emergence are obviously uh, very big parts um, of weed control for annuals and especially for annual bluegrass because the post-emergence options we have aren't very effective and the ones that we do have that are effective are relatively expensive. So um, a good timed application of a pre-emerge really helps with both crabgrass and poana in the fall. Uh, crabgrass, obviously, you're gonna wanna put out in your pre-emerge in the spring to control it since it is a warm season annual where poana is a cool season annual. Our next life cycle is biennial. Uh, these basically are, are an extra step above annual where it takes two growing seasons to complete the life cycle. Uh, the first year it typically produces a small rosette of leaves. It's not very, um, not big and showy. It doesn't really stick out to you. It kind of just lays there on the ground dormant looking or not really dormant, but it just kind of inconspicuous uh, and just kind of sits there, creates a good, nice root system and uh, just kind of hangs out grows vegetatively um, and then during the second year you have some stem elongation and then you have flowering and seed formation occur uh, and then after seed formation basically the plant dies so the one on the left is something hopefully you don't have it too often in your yard um, but it is one we see a lot on the roadsides and it is a kind of a classic example of a biennial uh, and that's queen's Anne's lace or wild carrot uh, so you can kind of see the way it looks like a carrot growing in the first year. Um, and then obviously we're pretty familiar with the, with the seed or with the flower uh, that we notice pretty regular, pretty easily on the right there in the center. Um, one we see a lot in pastures and you can see it a lot uh, quite often in the lawns as well uh, is thistles. That's the one over there on the right. And there are a ton of thistles ton of different um, tip, different thistles. Um, a lot of these can be beneficial 
Um, I know some of these can be edible. Now, would I want to eat them? Probably not. Uh, they just don't look too appetizing to me. But I know some of these can be. So, but don't take my word for it. I don't know which ones are. This is not an edible. Don't don't go out and just eat thistles because, um, again, I'm not an expert on thistles and I'm definitely not an expert on edible plants. That may be something that you may want to look into at another presentation, but um, I would not be the one good one to give that presentation. So, um, again, thistles are, are, are pretty common, especially here in South Mississippi, uh, up in Central Mississippi as well. See them on roadsides very, very frequently. You kind of see that big purple flower. Uh, typically see a lot of bumblebees and um, a lot of attract a lot of pollinators so and then we move into perennials so these are the longer live longest living types of plants um, we had the annuals one year biennials two years perennials live many growing seasons so two or more uh, or three or more I should say um, so they're generally only the top plant that, portion of the plant dies, either the root or a storage structure, whether it's a rhizome or some other tap root or something, some other corm or bulb or something that survives underground over the, um, the course of the winter or the summer, depending on which it is, its growing season is, um, survives and then it reemerges from that root uh, or bulb or corm the following growing season. Um, so they do reproduce by both seed and vegetative means. So they do produce a seed. It's not that they don't produce a seed. They just, the, the plant, that particular plant comes back from the roots. Um, but it does spread by seed and vegetative structures. So you can, a lot of these plants you can um, reproduce vegetatively as well. And since these are, do survive the winter through the root, these are typically treated post-emergence with a post-emergence herbicide instead of with pre-emergence doesn't te technically work at all on a perennial. Um, so typically post-emergence is the, about the only option we have as far as treating these. Um, something a lot of people may not realize and it kind of blew me away when I learned it back in college was that a dandelion was a perennial. Um, kind of makes sense when you pull one up and you see the root on that rascal, but um, you know, typically I just always thought dandelions, they, once they, you blew the, blew the seed off of a major wish, they, the plant basically died in the summer, but it just, um, you know, it does come back from those same roots each year. Um, and then in the top right, we have wild onion and wild garlic. Uh, those are both perennials as well. So typically I think the way to distinguish whether it is wild garlic or wild onion, wild garlic has a typically a more a rounder uh, leaf or whatever you want to call that. Uh, and it's hollow where wild onion is typically, uh, typically flat and solid instead of hollow like a garlic, um, the garlic leaf is. So now we move into the emergence time. So we have cool season plants and we have warm season plants. The first one is cool season. Um, cool season plants emerge in late summer, early fall. Uh, they typically set seed in the spring, whether it be mid to late spring and then die because of the heat and other factors. Um, eight, and other factors being that they have just uh, done their life cycle. Uh, you know they've lived they've done everything that they they set out to do when they germinated so uh, there's really no other no, no no reason for them to persist anymore um and you'll see here our two of our biggest cool season ones that i deal with the most or see the most for the most part is hen bit which is that one uh down in the bottom left with purple flower uh it's kind of has rosetting leaves around the stem round stems kind of a purple coloration to the or purple small purple flower um it can get a little can get a little hairy and a little uh shaggy in a lot of lawn situation uh this is kind of what you're out there mowing when it's you know early early season and nothing's really growing but your grass your, your yard doesn't look very well because of this growing irregularly um and kind of sticking up above but um 
blood the rest of your grass. So, and then the other one, as we mentioned earlier, um, Poana or annual bluegrass is over there on the right. Um, a lot of these, most all of these can be preventatively kept from being an issue by applying a pre-emerge. Um, depending on your location, typically down here in South Mississippi, uh, we recommend sometime um, beginning of September, somewhere around in there. So obviously, you know, the further north you are, you may need to back that up a little bit earlier, depending on your um, on your climatic conditions. But um, a lot of these can be controlled also uh, just by timely mowing to keep them from going to seed and re re-upping that seed bank. So a great way to prevent weeds is to prevent them from to going from going to seed to where they're restockpiling that seed bank into your soil. Uh, to where there's just less seed bank, less seed in that soil to begin with uh, of weeds to germinate. So uh, just a good timely mowing of when these things starting to begin to flower will prevent them from flowering and going to seed. Um, and you know, it is, it's not going to be just one mowing either. It's going to have to, you're going to have to do it every, every few days, unfortunately, uh, or maybe every week, but uh, just a good routinely mowing these things will we'll knock them back and a lot of times by the time they get ready to go to seed or flower by that time the heat has hit the heat the heat's gotten to us and then they they die because of the heat but just just reducing that seed pressure uh in your soil will prevent a lot of weeds from from ever becoming an issue then we move into our warm season um weeds so these are the ones that are out there that we're starting to see emerge now the cool seasons are the ones that we're kind of seeing out there straggling still maybe hanging on a little bit but uh, probably getting ready to to bite the bullet um and um so these now is a good time to treat for warm season perennials because they're still small um you know a, a small plant's usually a lot easier to kill than a big one that is um you know knee high or even a full, fully mature plant. So much smaller plants are a lot easier to kill. Uh, takes a lot less chemical, uh, a lot less applications. Um, and these emerge in late, mid to late spring. Again, like I said, when temperatures typically, soil temperatures uh, reach 55 to 60 degrees for about a week. Uh, so, you know, just the first sign of 70 degree, 80 degree weather doesn't necessarily mean that all of our warm season weeds are gonna are gonna emerge right then, it needs to be sustained. So once that soil temperature gets up and just a good soil thermometer can be a very good tool in the um, lawn manager's tool belt. So maybe something you, you may wanna look into just to help you out if you're interested. Um, usually you can kind of do that, I believe it's, um, well, Christian, what's that? There's a flower, a yellow vine flower that flowers in the early spring, kind of about this same time. You see it on the roadsides. Um, it's, I think it's poisonous to honeybees. It's, I can't think of it. I'll think of it in a second. But um, there's a weed or another, uh, I guess it's a weed on the roadsides that, that you'll see that, that that's, can be used as an indicator for basically for about the time you want to put out a pre-emerge uh, and I'll come back to that in a second when I think about it but so these germinate in mid to late spring grow throughout the summer and then they're usually killed by the first frost um, and for these you will want to um, put out a pre-emerge in the late winter early spring basically in south Mississippi we're looking at basically uh, um, mid-February early to mid-February uh, application so you may need to back that up to March or so for the northern Mississippi just because you're going to get warmer a little bit later um, and on this picture on this slide we're looking at crabgrass again on the bottom left just because it is a perennial um, favorite of questions of how do I get rid of it um, and usually about the best way to get rid of it is just to prevent it from coming up um, we don't have very great post-emergence control for crabgrass. A lot of times you can use something um, 
that has quinclorac active ingredient in it. Um, that can somewhat be, be effective. Um, but, you know, you got to catch it early. Once it gets to be a bit, pretty big plant, I think quinclorac's up to like a four leaf stage, I believe, control. Um, but again, it's a lot easier and a lot more economical to prevent, to, to kill it when it's small and um, prevent it from coming up, from ever becoming an issue than it is to try to treat it uh, once it becomes a, once it becomes a large nuisance plant. Um, the one on the right there uh, on the bottom is spurge. Uh, you don't necessarily see this a lot in uh, home lawns. You can see it kind of on the borders between the lawn and flower beds, things like that. One good way to identify this weed is if you break a stem, it will have a little white milky substance that just kind of pulls out of the end of it maybe drips out a little bit, you know, it's not going to just gush out, but it, it will kind of pool up on the end of the broken stem. Um, pretty easy to control, uh, usually grown, you see it there on cracks of driveways and uh, sidewalks, that sort of thing. It is a, it does kind of like those, those, those areas. And another one that I see a lot of on the top right, uh, I see a lot in centipede and St. Augustine grass is Lespedeza. Um, there are a couple of different types of Lespedeza, um, but typically here, either there's two varieties typically, um, and they're both controlled basically the same way. Um, typically either a met sulfuron product or like a, um, two, four D trimec type mix. Um, I think I saw maybe did I see a question come through. On the chat, I can't get up there to see. Anyway, to get Virginia creeper. So, are you wanting to like get rid of Virginia creeper? I'll take it. Um, typically, Virginia creeper, where it's growing, uh, you can usually get rid of it either with a glyphosate product. It's usually, um, you know, not growing in your yard it's usually growing up something or on a fence line or along the side of a house or something like that um typically just mechanical removal and possibly like a cut stump treatment of glyphosate product or a glyphosate product just a, a spray application um rosemary bushes uh okay um in that case, probably just gonna have to do mechanical removal. Uh, try to find out where it is located, where it's rooting from, um, cause you're probably not, I don't, can't think of a herbicide that you're gonna want to apply on your, on your rosemary that's not going, you know, that's either A, not gonna kill your rosemary or B, that you're, you know, typically herbicides don't have a, pre-harvest uh, pre-harvest interval where uh, you usually don't use herbicides on edible crops so um, you know in that case I would just try to find where the root is and you know or the where it's originating from uh, and maybe just maybe apply a little bit of glyphosate to down to the base of the plant um, I know glyphosate is able to be used in a garden pre-plant um, so, you know, if you're just putting a, a touch of it on there, um, I, I wouldn't be afraid to do it if you, if, you know, I wouldn't obviously put it on my rosemary plant, but, um, or right up next to it, but hopefully it's, you may need to dig up your rosemary plant and separate it out and replant it somewhere else, uh, until you can get the Virginia creeper controlled. But, um. Unfortunately, I don't have a great answer for that. Maybe Christian can chime in on that since he's more of a horticulture vegetable guy. He may have another option for you. Um, got another one here, weeds with stickers taking over. Uh, if you've already got the stickers, if they've got stickers, unfortunately, you're out of luck this year. Um, this is another perennial, and I don't know how I forgot that one um, to put that one on here, but it is a – cool season annual um, and it is lawn burrweed is what it typically is 
Um, there are some other options that it could be, but for the most part, it's kind of a slow growing, kind of a, looks like a little carrot plant or something, maybe a little, uh, got little fronds. Uh, and it does as long, and when it's got the stickers, you're too late. Um, you have to catch it before it gets the, makes the stickers. Um, so typically we say in January, February, uh, you can use a post-emergence herbicide. Uh, a lot of times you can either use like a metsulfuron product or a atomic product, depending on the type of grass you have. Um, so you'll want to read the label, make sure you, you know, the product that you're using is labeled for your type of grass. Um, and then obviously treat according to, um, to the label directions. But a lot of times, again, that pre-emergence application back in August or September um, will prevent this from becoming a problem. So if you know you had it last year, um, you're probably going to have it again next year because especially if it's gone to seed like it is now, typically once those seeds have dried off and hardened off, that's when they start to stick um, or become stickers. Uh, when they're still green and pliable, they're not a not that you know they're not uncomfortable to walk over. But it's until they the plant starts to dry down and those stickers harden off is when they really become stickers. So a pre-emergence in August September and post-emergence herbicide for any escapes or places you may have missed uh, on a nice warm day January February with a either a met sulfuron product or a Trimec type 2,4-D dicamba MCPP um, product. Do you apply the pre-emergent in flower beds? Um, there are pre-emergents that are labeled for flower bed use, and that is for, and there's also pre-emergents that are labeled for vegetable garden use. Um, not all of them though, so please read the label, read the do a little little bit of looking. There are some either a, um, I think snapshot. I know snapshot is one that is able to be used in flower beds. Obviously, you don't want to use it in flower beds where you are planting seeds. You only want to be using transplants or in a established flower bed, whether it be like a shrub bed or a you know. A, a foundation planting around your house, something like that, but you can use pre-emergence in those in those in those areas. Uh, again, not all pre-emergence are the same, and not all are labeled for for flower bed use. But um, there are some that are available. Uh, I think uh, trifluralin is one that is able to be used in vegetable production, depending on what you're growing. Uh, atrazine is depending on what you're growing. So we do have some options in vegetable production in the gardens outside of the lawn uh, area, but typically you know you have to make sure you, what your the area you're wanting to treat is on the is on the label of the product you're wanting to use. Okay. Um, now I can't figure out how to get off of my chat out of the way. I don't know if that's in y'all's way, right? In y'all's way or not. Um, but um, so Lespedeza, again, you uh, um, either a pre emergence herbicide or a post emergence, you use something like 2,4 D dicamba mix, the tri trimec type products, or met sulfuron post emergence. So the key to good weed control, um, obviously the best thing you can do to have, have good weed control is just to have a good healthy turf. Um, a good healthy turf basically shades out the ground uh, and prevents the, the seeds from ever receiving sunlight, uh, kind of shades out those seeds and to prevent them from ever germinating to begin with. Um, but um, some other steps you need to take to ensure good weed control are number one, do a proper identification of what the weed is. Uh, without proper identification, you can't make, you gotta, you know, it's hard to make sure that you're choosing the right herbicide um, to, 
to control that species. So uh, you got to make sure you're, you're doing the right ID uh, and then obviously the right timing of herbicide application, whether that is a pre or a post in that pre or post uh, emergence application, that's obviously going to, um, you know, make a big difference in the timing. Obviously, pre-emergence, you want to do it before the, you want to apply that before the plant emerges. Post-emergence, you want to try to get it out there pretty soon after it emerges, uh, just so it's easier to, to kill that small plant, as I mentioned earlier, instead of that great big plant when it becomes fully mature. You want to make sure that you use the correct rate during your herbicide application. So read your label good, make sure it fits as typically you want to use the high rate. A lot of times, uh, depending on the species, a lot of times, um, or depending on the label, it will give you a range of rates to use. And typically you want to use the high rate. Uh, less rates can cause some resistance issues and you're just, you may end up using twice as much chemical and you know more time going out there and applying it more times just trying to kill the same uh, same plant than you could have just one application at the higher rate so always stay within the guidelines or on the label but typically you want to use the higher rate unless it's known to to only take the half rate or the lesser rate uniformity of coverage is very important obviously this is much more important with pre emergence applications than it is post emergence um, because any skips of anything like that in your pre emergence application will will allow escapes to come up so um, we typically recommend going two directions with your pre emergence applications at a half a rate in two directions so you get the full rate but you're just splitting it in two two applications um, so you want to go east to west or, you know, left to right and then north to south with half the rate and then east to west with half the rate. And then that gives you the full rate um, and it just prevents you doing any skips. Just like with your fertilizer applications, this is kind of the same way. You want to do, do if you want to put out 10 pounds of a product, you'd like to put five pounds out north to south and five pounds east to west. That way, any areas that you may have missed going east to west, you probably got the five pounds on going north to south. So uh, that's a great way to prevent a lot of your problems and a lot of your skips is just by going two directions with half the rate. But, and then an application or an activation of your herbicide. A lot of your, most all of your pre-emergence herbicides are going to 